Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another podcast from the Horses Advocate. This is Dr. Jeff Tucker. Dot T to everyone. I am excited because I have several days off, and I chose these times to have these days off so I could listen to the American Association of Equine Practitioners Conference that's being held in San Antonio from the 18th to the 22nd of 2022. So I took the time off because I decided to attend virtually and listen to all their sessions right here in my home. And I've done this before. I've done this for the past two years. During the pandemic, that's all they had. And I was I, I was prepared to make a lot of podcasts going over all these different things that they have here to talk about. And I was totally side hit by the side. What's that called? Blindsided by the fact that they don't have them live this year. And now I'm frustrated because as of this morning, the second day, I'm able to see only two of yesterday's performances, which just is mind boggling. I mean, I, I spent close to 500 bucks to have the attendance here and I should be able to see it live. And I have no idea why AAP is doing it this way this year. But I wanted to listen to the Kester News Hour, which is just uh, about an hour of tidbits of podcast or of uh, reports that they have that I could just uh, be able to say to you, uh, this is what they're talking about. They also had a keynote presentation called Boundaries, When to Say Yes and How to Say No When You Need To. And I found it interesting because I saw a synopsis in my email this morning. And basically, this presenter took what Stephen Covey talked about decades ago in his book, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where he puts our lives in quadrants with what is important and urgent, what is important but not urgent what is urgent but not important, and what is not urgent and what is not important, which boils down to it's important to feed your horses, but it may not be urgent um, until a certain time where urgency starts to creep up and then you have to do it. So, and what's not important, what's not urgent is cleaning the cobwebs and cleaning up the tack. Uh, sometimes that's put off because it's not urgent and it's not that important. So, it is to some people, I'm just saying, I'm trying to put this into context of us horse owners, uh, waiting for a check in the mail uh, may be urgent and important. And as soon as you see the mail truck coming down the road, you run out to the mailbox. That would be urgent and important, but nobody runs to the mailbox to get their junk mail. That's not urgent and it's not important. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. So uh, I, I'm just, I was so excited and looking forward to making these podcasts that would explain a lot of the stuff that we're having uh, introduced to us. And unfortunately, it has to be spread out over several months as I find the time to get to right. recordings, listen to them and take my tests so I will attain my continuing education credits. But I wanted to talk about some of the things that I've selected. One was interpreting dental radiographs. Now, this sounds like a really important topic uh, for a lot of people who, when you look at the radiograph of a horse, you're like confused because there's so many fine lines and we don't know what really is good and what's really bad. And this has all been brought on by better technology. Back in the day when I was taking radiographs, we could barely penetrate the skull and we couldn't see much. And it wasn't that fine in detail. Now we can do that at stable side and take a look at tooth root, and anomalies and then uh, define that as a pathology or disease. And I think that's really great. Unfortunately, I don't like the treatments that they're assigning to the pathologies that they have. And that's a discussion for another day, I think, because uh, interpreting dental radiographs, I've looked at them. I've seen abscesses formed around a tooth and the owner decided not to do anything but to wait and see because it's not urgent. It's important, but not urgent. And we have time with these 
dental diseases because they're so slow moving. So they came back two weeks later and took another radiograph and the obvious uh, pus pocket, which you can see on the radiographs around the tooth had moved completely away from that tooth and had gone to another tooth. So if they had pulled the tooth that they thought was infected, they would have created a hole that is basically draining the abscess, but it was the, the tooth didn't need to come out. And this horse uh, did just fine on some antibiotics and cured itself. And to this day is doing fine. Some of the other uh, topics were approaches to the horse with poor performance. I think that's really good because again, I'm going to listen to these presenters to hear what they have to say, but I'm also listening to hear what they don't say. And I think that's just as important. So I wanted to pay attention to that and I'll have to have a podcast on this later. Um, this morning they had a sunrise session, a recovery, nutrition, feeding strategies, strategies for the equine patient. And of course that was um, presented by Purina and Purina of course has their, you know, a stake in this game. They want to make sure that you recover. And the last sunrise uh, nutrition conference that I saw sponsored by Purina was back in, I think three or four years ago in San Francisco. And they talked about their product that prevented gastric ulcers and they thought it was really great. And the very last sentence of their presentation was, oh, and by the way, we don't believe that ulcers in the hindgut are very important. So we're not looking at it. And I was like blown away, <laughs> you know, because that's where all the behavioral issues are coming from. Uh, and that just really bugs me. So um, they also had a product demonstrations by Mars Equestrian, a family of equine brands, presents a unique holistic approach to insulin dysregulation, diagnostics, and management. And that's where I want to land today because in the email, they said, in getting ready for today's brilliant uh, speaker, and I say brilliant because you have to be an elite in what you're talking about to be invited for this lecture. It's held every Sunday. It's called the Frank J. Milne State-of-the-Art Lecture. And I've known the lecturers in the past. Um, Dr. Tom Divers, who it was at Cornell in internal medicine, leading a uh, liver expert and other um, diseases, was asked to speak. And it, it was just so fascinating to listen to this guy talk about how the liver uh, works. Um, the other one was Dr. Norm Ducharme, who's also at Cornell, who uh, I knew as a student. I knew, I've knew i known both Dr. Divers and Dr. Ducharme, and Dr. Ducharme talked about the laryngeal function, and uh, it, was, it just blew me away how, how much information they have. Let's see, they've had other guest speakers, names that most horse people know, um, but today it is... Um, here it is. Where is it? Oh, uh, Dr. Aaron Contino and Dr. Susan Stover. And most people recognize Dr. Stover because she's written so many books. And this title is called Skeletal Injuries in Equine Athletes, Pathogenesis and Training Concepts for Injury Prevention. And I cannot wait to read to listen to that recording. You know, I'm hovering over it now and it says the recording's not available because it's happening as I speak right now. But I was just I was just looking forward to it because I wanted to know what part of nutrition they were going to emphasize and how important that is. So y'all have to wait on that. I'll have that coming out soon. But what they did was they sent out a a uh, paper that they wanted us to read. And this kind of ties into the uh, the other convention, the, the one that I talked about from Mars, talking about insulin dysregulation. So insulin dysregulation just means that the insulin um, isn't being regulated properly. Dys means dysfunction. And so the functioning of the pituitary is not uh, correct, or insulin is not correct, not the pituitary. Sorry about that. So... They put out a paper called Review of Considerations When Feeding the Equid with Insulin Dysregulation by P.A. Harris, who is a master's 
and uh, a veterinarian and a PhD, which is like the, you know, the guy just lives in 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 a um, in a university someplace. I mean, that takes uh, probably ten years to get all that done, plus his undergraduate um, in in um, education. He's also a diplomat of the ECVCN, which I'm not too sure what all these things mean. Uh, MRCVS, of course, uh, that's a veterinary degree in the uh, United Kingdom, and RCVS. And I'm giving these letters, and I don't know what they all mean. I really don't know. Uh, then he says, specialist clinical nutrition, and then in parentheses, equine. So this guy apparently has spent a lot of time in the laboratory and in the field doing experiments on equine nutrition. I don't know who P.A. Harris is. I think it's wonderful that um, he or she is, is helping out here. The first name is Pat, P-A-T, but that could be a male or female. And I read the whole page and it goes about the introduction of general principles. Um, and then he lists the general guidelines for feeding management of insulin resistant horses. So all of us know about insulin resistance or think we know about insulin resistance. And according to this, um, insulin dysregulation reflects the presence of one or more of the following. A baseline or fasting hyperinsulinemia. So in other words, when you haven't eaten, you have insulin in the blood. Tissue insulin resistance, which just means that insulin is there, but it's not doing its job of delivering the glucose. Exaggerated insulin response to ingested non-structural carbohydrates. And non-structural carbohydrates are NCS, uh, uh, pardon me, NSCs. You've heard of NSCs before. It's the starches, it's the simple sugars, and it's the fructans. And fructans is how uh, plants store fructose. And then finally, the fourth is and or exaggerated insulin response to IV provided simple sugars. And that's where you dose a sugar and then you see what the response is from insulin. And it's recognized as the main consistent feature of equine metabolic syndrome or EMS with an associated risk of laminitis. So we all know that. You know, our horses, if they're insulin uh, resistant and they have equine metabolic syndrome, um, and then you feed them too much sugar, you put them out of the green pasture of the spring with high fructans, your horse suffers from laminitis, which could be fatal. And I think anybody who's been through it doesn't consider this a, 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 a small thing. This is pretty profound. So this uh, person, uh, Dr. Harris, wants to discuss... Uh, how to handle these things. And he does bring up a really interesting point. He says, not all EMS animals or age animals are obese and therefore nutritional management of an ID or insulin dysregulated animal needs to take into account various factors, including body condition score, BCS, pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, PPID, um, and is not necessarily consistent. And therefore, monitoring and repeat testing is essential, especially in animals at increased risk. I agree. I think that uh, testing for insulin resistance is important. But if you've listened to some of my other podcasts of insulin resistance in humans, you'll understand that insulin resistance starts with inclusion of fat, specifically um, uh, diglycerides, which are not triglycerides, but diglycerides. So they only have two uh, fatty acids attached to glycerol inside the cell uh, of the muscle cell. So they have intracellular fat in humans. And that's the first sign of this dysfunction that's occurring. And that can be seen in young 20 year old humans well before they have any blood work that suggests that they're becoming insulin resistance. So I think most of us listening to this, unless we've been keenly aware and paying attention to our nutrition since we've been about 15 to 20 years old are going to find out that we all have insulin resistance in the very beginning stages. In fact, if you have accumulated more body fat or if your horse has accumulated more body fat than it should have, it's probably because insulin is doing a fantastic job 
of taking the sugar that you're eating and putting it into your fat cells. In other words, the insulin is not doing that good a job of putting the sugar into the cells for work. So now the only other place glucose can go is into the fat cell where glucose is converted into fatty acid and stored there. It's that simple, folks. It really is. And I know you and I have been taught since we were kids that if you want to lose weight, meaning if you want to lose body fat, you have to decrease the amount of calories you put in your mouth and increase the amount of ex export of fat, meaning exercise. Um, and most of us don't want to do that. And if we have a horse with laminitis, it certainly becomes more impossible to do that because the horse can't move. So it is a balance. It's um, what goes in. Uh, if it's not used, it's stored. And then when it is used from storage, it goes out. So if you add a uh, thousand calories into your diet in the day and you exert enough energy to use up a thousand calories, your net gain will be zero. If you put in a thousand, if you put in 2000 calories and you're, and you exert only a thousand calories of ex exercise, then the remaining thousand calories will be put into storage. And this is the point of contention that so many people have that on one side, it's all about calories counting, that calories in and calories out is everything. And on the other side, they'll say that has nothing to do with it. Uh, calories in, calories out, you can eat all the calories you want, as long as you know what you're doing with them through the hormonal process that it is inside you and me and our horses. And you can put your dog and cat in this category as well, because all mammals basically have very similar pathways. So when, when we feed our horses more sugar than they need in a day, then that sugar cannot be excreted. That sugar must be placed either in the muscle cell, in the liver, or it has to be uh, put into body fat and stored for later. And that's the job of insulin. And this is why I find that the insulin dysregulation moniker that they're putting on this is, I guess, technically right, but it's confusing because insulin is doing its job perfectly. Insulin is not the problem. And then those of us who do have diabetes, maybe our dog or cat has it, and we end up giving more insulin through an injection, that's actually adding to the problem, which is so frustrating because when you add insulin, yes, it takes the excess glucose, and, and stores it, but you end up getting more body fat. And yes, you do decrease your blood glucose, which is important, but it's not getting rid of the cause. And the cause is simply too much sugar being put in our mouth. So with our horses, we have to look at these high starch uh, diets and start to realize that that's not helping our horses at all. So he goes into general principles here. It says the primary goal in the feeding management of horses and ponies with ID, remember insulin dysregulation is called ID, and they say obese or non-obese is avoidance of feeds rich in non-structural carbohydrates, which is basically the starch and the water-soluble carbohydrates, such as simple sugars and fructans. They may risk, that may risk the, um, risk of laminitis, either by exacerbation of hyperinsulinemia, which means increased insulin in the blood, but that's not causing laminitis. That's just correlation. That's not causation. And possibly via disturbances to the hindgut microbial community that may trigger events that lead to laminitis. So basically this fella, uh, this, this doctor, uh, researcher is is throwing his hands up in the air and saying, well, if you feed a lot of sugar, we don't know actually how it works, but you could get laminitis. And he says, for lean animals, the objective may be weight maintenance or even weight gain using feeds and forages that do not promote an exaggerated insulin response. An essential goal in these obese insulin dysregulated animals is to promote weight loss primarily through restricted energy intake supported by increased energy expenditure, which is like less food in, more exercise. Um, 
So this is this is just fascinating because I've been going over this for a while. And those of you who've listened to my podcast in the past know that I'm a big fan of getting rid of all grains because as he calls it, cereal grains, which means you know oats and corn and barley and um, anything, rice, uh, all these things have excess starch. And I also have been making a big push to decrease the amount of hay that we give because most of the hay is last summer's grass and you're feeding last summer's grass in the middle of winter. And that is abnormal. That is not what horses do. Horses are stuck with the dormant grasses or they've migrated someplace, but still in winter, they still have a dormant um, sugar content in the grasses. And if they're migrating, they're using up a lot more calories than your horse that's sitting in the stall 23 hours a day or sitting out in a paddock doing nothing but eating grass. So I couldn't agree more. You've got to decrease the sugar. I have suggested in the past that there's a pathway, at least in humans, where fructose, which is the fructans uh, of the grasses, can be converted with it. Um, through the Krebs cycle into uric acid. And uric acid in humans is highly inflammatory, causing inflammation of the kidneys. And the kidneys control through the angiotensin system, the uh, blood pressure. And they've been able to lower blood pressure by removing all fructans, all fruit, all fruit juices uh, from human diets and mouse diets. And they've been able to also create hypertension or high blood pressure by adding fruit by adding fructose. And remember that spoonful of sugar is 50% fructose. If it tastes sweet, it's fructose. If it doesn't taste sweet, it's probably glucose. And glucose is supposed to go into the Krebs cycle and spit out some electrons that make us uh, stay alive. But fructose only goes through the cycle once and sparks off a couple of electrons to keep us uh, alive. But then it also, um, it also creates this uric acid and uric acid is bad. And this is where I talked about salt because they found that if you add salt to a human who has this uh, enzyme that converts um, uric acid um, or it converts glucose into fructose, if you eat salt before you hydrate yourself, that will trigger that enzyme to create all the glucose that you eat, like in your vegetables, and it will convert that glucose uh, especially the starchy ones, which is all strings of glucose, let's use your potatoes or what's in corn or what's in um, oats, and it will convert that into fructose and increase your blood pressure. So that's why they restrict salt on a diet. In, in reality, you're supposed to drink a lot of water and then have your salted pretzel and watch the ball game. Uh, but don't eat something salty and then say, oh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm thirsty. Then it's too late. You've already triggered aldose reductase and it's moved into creating fructose, and that's just gonna maintain your blood pressure. So any of you who have high blood pressure, um, just uh, hydrate yourself before eating anything salty and get rid of all fruit, including fruit juices and dried fruits, uh, which is tough to say because we're getting close to Christmas and my wife just bought all these dried fruits to make fruit cake, as she does every year to send to her father. And um, it's, it's not good for you, <laughs> but it is Christmas, so enjoy it. Uh, but just don't enjoy it all year long. That's what I'm saying. So let me go on further in this uh, before you're totally bored to tears, because a lot of you who've listened to me a lot know that this is a repeat. But what I'm trying to get across to you is here is a um, paper, and I, I don't know where it was published. Um, no, it's just in the AAP proceedings, American Association of Equine Practitioners proceedings. And they wanted me to read this before I learned about something. I don't know, it's, it's all part and parcel of health in the horse. Uh, so the general guidelines for feeding management of insulin resistant horses are included below. And they list um, these five, let's see, yeah, six, six things. <laughs> this is gonna be fun to go through. <laughs> Remember, pay attention to what's not there. Okay, the removal of cereal grains and high moderate non-structural carbohydrates, sweet complementary feeds which is feedstuffs rich in starch and or sugars. So the starch content of oats, barley, and corn uh, are pretty high. 
and uh, sweet feeds can be uh, up to 50% non-structural carbohydrates. So he and I are absolutely in lockstep agreement. Get rid of all the grains. Just stop feeding them. It is killing our horses. It's killing us. You know, I, I know how much it, it, it Fruit Loops taste good. And uh, I used to eat bowlfuls of Raisin Bran. Uh, I don't anymore. I still love the idea of having Raisin Bran. Uh, it filled my void. I felt satiated but it never really satiated me for a long time. And now I know why, because I was eating a bowl full of sugar with sugar in the fruit and uh, it, it just wasn't good. So we've all been indoctrinated to have cereal for breakfast and breads and toasts and bagels and donuts and stuff. But all of that is just loading us up with sugar. Now, if you want to have your donut or bagel in the morning, fine, just that's it. Limit it so you're not taking in more glucose in a day than you need. Uh, you, you, there are certain pleasures that if you're devoid of pleasures, it can stress you. And I know with the horses, when coming down the barn, they start nickering and pawing at the door because you're going to give them some grain. This is a pleasure thing for you as a horse owner. You want to feel like you're needed uh, where it's, it's a safe place, your barn, you're feeding the horse. They love you. You give them a carrot, a sugar cube, something like that, and they show affection. But it's a true affection. And it's been something I've been saying for a while. And apparently Dr. Phil has been saying it. Uh, I didn't get it from him, but we're saying the same thing. Food does not equal love. Just remember, if you're giving a treat, something out of your hand, try to make it a non-sugar treat. Add a peanut in the shell. Horses love peanuts. Peanuts are a legume, no different than alfalfa. We feed peanut hay down here in the South. Uh, peanuts are fine. Uh, in the shell, feed one or two of them, the horse will still love you and show you that attention you all are craving, but you're not adding a glucose load. So just keep that in mind. That might be helpful. Step number two, it said feeding multiple small low NSC meals. So that was interesting. And there's a lot of uh, information in this paragraph. It basically says, if you're going to feed sugar meals, feed small amounts frequently. Um, I don't think that's, I, I understand what he's trying to say. Uh, I'll read it. However, recent work has suggested that severely um, insulin dysregulated animals can have exaggerated insulinemic responses, even to small intakes of complementary feeds with a threshold between 0.08 and 0.15 grams per non-structural carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. So that's a mouthful. And I still think no sugar is the best way to go. So I guess the one way is if you're feeding hay, just feed a flake multiple times throughout the day, and that will help uh, diminish the load. I used to, or I have talked about in the past, um, insulin's brothers, it's a good twin brother. Because if you look at insulin, it's the evil twin. The good twin is glucagon. So glucagon and insulin have a ratio. And insulin's job is not only to create fat from sugar, but it also to drive it into the fat cell and leave it in the fat cell. So if the sugar is now a fatty acid and shoved in a fat cell, insulin will start, stand guard on the, out, on the door and will let it out. So as long as the insulin's around, you can't lose body fat. Then on the flip side, if insulin's not around, glucagon comes and opens the door of the fat cell and helps let the fat out. So it's insulin to glucagon ratio. And it's been reported that in humans, again, this I can't give it to you in horses, and he's not going to tell you in this article, but in humans, if you have an insulin to glucagon ratio of about one to one or less than one, like 0.8 to one, then glucagon is going to do its job. It's going to keep bringing the body fat out. One of the best ways you can do that is through intermittent fasting or fasting for several days. In fact, most functional med medical doctors realize that if you want to get the person off the roller coaster of insulin resistance, you basically put them on a four day fast and that will drive all the um, insulin down to zero and glucagon has a chance to start its process of moving the body fat out. And that will help insulin resistance and diabetes like nothing else. There's no better treatment than a four day fast.
Now, in most American diets in humans, the insulin to glucagon ratio is four to one, which means there's four times more insulin than glucagon, which basically means that we're going to keep storing body fat. It's going to be very difficult for us to lose our body fat. I think the same is true in humans. I know that when I went through vet school, the um, endocrinologists would talk about insulin and glucagon all the time, and I didn't get it back then. It's very complicated. There are other factors that are involved, um, but I just want you to focus on insulin glucagon ratio for this point, number two. When you go to the steakhouse and you order yourself a big steak because you're saying, this is great, I'm having protein. And protein is so important. I hear Dr. Tucker saying all the time that we have to have protein. And so you order the steak to get the protein. But as you're waiting, they put those rolls down in front of you. They're fresh, hot rolls. Some of them are kind of sweetened. It depends on what um, restaurant you're at. And you, you have to have an appetizer. So you get the, um, um, the blooming onion or something like that. And then you eat this meal and then you have the chocolate thunder from down under, uh, which is ice cream and chocolate drizzle on a brownie or something. I don't know. Um, it's interesting because insulin to glucagon ratio goes from four to one to 70 to one, 70 times more insulin than glucagon. And when that happens, what's interesting is the protein is never actually consumed, but the protein is actually turned into glucose. Um, and it's through gluconeogenesis because there's so much insulin going around, it plummets your glucose. And when it plummets your glucose, your brain keeps screaming for more uh, protein, uh, glucose because the brain needs glucose to keep working. So it will convert the protein you just stuck in your mouth, a big steak, and it'll turn it into um, body fat. So, or turn it into glucose, which could become more body fat if, if fed enough. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful of the ratios. This is where the hormonal balance is so important. Those people who don't believe it's calories in, calories out, who believe that it's all about hormonal control of body fat, this is where it lies. How are you controlling insulin and glucagon? And once you get the insulin and glucagon working perfectly, then the, the glucose that you're eating, the excess glucose, can be actually utilized properly and uh, maintain your brain health and uh, give your muscles enough energy to get out of the way and do their job. So that's what happens with insulin and glucagon. And he's suggesting that you feed small meals so you don't have that huge spike all the time. So the insulin can come down. And as it comes down, the glucagon can do its job. And that's why he's saying small, multiple, low, uh, non-structural carbohydrate meals. That's great. Um, number three, restricted or zero access to pasture. This is a time-honored tradition in horses that if your horse has insulin resistance, and certainly laminitis, you um, you take them off the pasture or you put a grazing muzzle on them or you do whatever it takes to make sure that they don't have access. So basically you're decreasing the glucose intake. Uh, I think it's it's miserable to put a muzzle on a horse. I, I think some horses don't mind it, but you know a lot of horses do. And I think it's tough. And I don't know what you can do about that. Um, he goes on, he puts in italics, practically, practical, prac anyway, it doesn't matter. It means for some individual animals, access to pasture has to be prevented or highly restricted, especially at certain times of the year. Well, that would be the springtime where the grass is actively growing and it's going to be higher in these non-structural carbohydrates. Strategies such as the use of a track system, that's where you... Do you portion off part of the pasture uh, to keep them moving to find more grass. It keeps them off the grass. You can put hay scattered at several spots in a large field. So the horse has to actually exercise to go from one step place to the next to get more food. Strip grazing, same principle as there. Grazing muzzles, which I think are, are horrible. And rotational grazing may need to be considered depending on individual circumstances, but monitoring is essential. It's important to note that comp compensatory intake can occur in animals left grazing, foraging, once any grazing muzzle has been removed, which may increase their risk of laminitis. And that's true. 
There's no doubt about it. So unless you've got your finger on the pulse, and that's figuratively and, and actual. In other words, you're taking the pulse of the hooves every day. You're feeling for heat in the, them. You're watching the horse walk, especially moving them backwards. Uh, if they're showing any signs of, of sore feet, you've got a problem and it's a medical emergency. That's urgent and important. And you have to get on it right away. Um, and the, of course, the best way to avoid that is to decrease the amount of uh, pasture the horse can have. And that's what he wants to get across. It's the past you're stupid. <laughs> and I get that. But it's also last summer's grass that you're feeding in the form of hay. Remember, hay has been around for a short period of time. Just think about it. Uh, if horses have been around for millions of years, and we've been in agriculture for about eight to 12,000 years, 10,000 years or something like that, uh, we didn't start cutting hay until maybe the 1800s where we had these scythes, these long knives that we cut the hay with and we picked it up by hand and we stored it and we kept it in reserve for when the horses or our cattle needed some sort of forage in the middle of winter when it was cold. And we had to give them some food. That was the purpose of hay. Then came uh, tractors and bailing machines. And that was in the 50s, I'm gonna guess, something like that after World War II. Uh, 1945, when we started to be able to make uh, these machines in in our in our in our worlds that were not distraught by uh, fighting, our industrial age, if you will, and then we had uh, gasoline that was there to drive the tractors, and then we had roads built in 1960 by uh, President Eisenhower set up the interstate system. And we had telephones and we were able to call people and say, can you bring me a, a you know, big truckload of hay? And it would come and drop, be dropped off. So it's basically since the 70s that this has occurred. So if it's 2022 now, I'd be saying basically about 50 to 60 years, we've had hay being delivered to our farms. This is new. When horses have evolved to eat over millions of years and in the past 50 to 60 years, we found a way to start feeding them year round because we can't afford to have a pasture that's big enough to support our horse. Then, you know, this is where the trouble starts. It really starts from the unnatural horsemanship that we have in maintaining and keeping horses. And I understand that if you only have one or two or three acres, you should only have one horse, you know, maybe two at best. Uh, the, as you add more horses, they're going to consume that grass and you have to supplement with hay. And now we have grass and hay bringing non-structural carbohydrates into the field and causing all these problems, this laminitis that when I went to vet school in 1980, we knew ponies got it. We knew some horses got it. They're usually obese, um, but it was really rare in most horses. Now warm bloods and thoroughbreds get laminitis like a Shetland pony does. It's just ridiculous how common that is. So anyway, that is number three. Number four, a diet based on grass hay or hay substitute with low, meaning less than 10 to 12% dry matter, non-structural um, carbohydrate content. And the problem is, as he says, it's not possible to determine the NSC content of forage by eye. Although warm season haze, for example, may naturally have a lower non-structural carbohydrate content than cool season grasses. In other words, um, hmm. the cold season means that the grasses in the northern climate have to uh, be prepared for their winter of dormancy, whereas in the in the warm uh, seasons, like down here in South Florida, the grasses are constantly uh, using their carbohydrates. So they'll have a somewhat lower non-structural carbohydrate because it's always being put into use. Uh, if it is essential that the individual is fed a low NSC forage, then analysis is essential and or monitoring the insulin response to feeding the, the specific batch of forage. Um, the author recommends that hay rather than haylage is fed to insulin dysregulated animals not least because haylage may promote a greater insulin response for a given level of consumed NSC in ID animals. So uh, haylage just isn't fed in America. It's very popular in the United Kingdom and other countries. 
And I'm not too sure if that actually is, I think, any hay. Haylage or not, I, you, you just got to cut down the sugar. So what he does is he follows this up in italicized print. It says, practically, hay soaking can result in around 40% loss of WSC content. That's the water-soluble carbohydrate content. That's the fructans and the simple sugars and the starch. And therefore, is a useful adjunct to managing both overweight animals and those prone to laminitis. However, especially with cool season grasses, WSC loss is highly variable and not predictable. In addition, it is important to remember that dry matter is also lost when soaking, as well as some soluble protein and a portion, a proportion of certain vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. Therefore, it is necessary to allow for 20% loss of dry matter with soaking when calculating hay intakes and importantly provide an appropriate forage balancer, especially when feeding soaked forage but also if feeding a forage-based diet or less than recommended intakes of core complementary feed. So I'm listening to this and warning bells are ringing. And I'm saying, okay, go over this again. He's saying that if you do soak the hay, it's going to lose more than just the simple sugars. You're also going to lose vitamins, minerals, and trace elements and proteins, soluble proteins. So then he says, you need to add a forage balancer. So I'm going to jump to the end of this, all right? Where it says, declaration of ethics. The author has adhered to the principles of veterinary medical ethics of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Okay. But then it says conflict of interest, which he has to state. And he says, the author is employed by Mars Pet Care UK. Mars Pet Care UK is a huge, huge, huge company. So Mars Pet Care has a wonderful, beautiful website where it talks about how through their company, they're going to make a better world for pets through sustainable uh, pet care. Our business, our businesses are imagining a more sustain, sustainable future. So they want to make sure that their packaging is good, that they are sustaining uh, growth like on coral reefs. They're actually building coral reefs. Kudos to them. I think that's so important. My son is so involved with that. They're trying to clean up the environment. They're trying to make all their products carbon neutral. Um Let's see what else they, oh, they're, I uh, want diversity and inclusion in their business. So that's a big thing. Um, they want to raise awareness of pet homelessness. Uh, it's kind of funny because I see a lot of homeless squirrels out there these days. Uh, they find a home, they, they do just fine, but they're talking about the pets that are raised by humans, such as dogs and cats, and then are, are thrown out on the curb and they have to live a life it doesn't have all the uh, comforts of our homes. They're also uh, shaping the future of veterinary care, supporting researchers in the efforts to understand the amazing bond we share with our pets. So they're heavily invested in the emotional connection. They're using artificial intelligence to uh, have vets diagnose disease early. Again, not prevent, but to diagnose. Blows my mind. Um, and I've got another thing to say on that, but let me finish this. Uh, could therapy dogs help aging adults cope with loneliness? Yeah, I agree. They do until the pet dies and the old person is left without the pet. It, it's a double-edged sword. I know because I'm older and I've buried most of my animals and I've got some more animals and who knows when I'll have to bury them. Do I get another pet? Because I don't want to bury another one. So it's it's tough. And then delivering high quality, compassionate veterinary care for every pet, science and data at the heart of our veterinary business. Uh, they own Mars, owns Banfield Pet Hospitals, uh, Veterinary Clinics of America, VCA, uh, Veterinary Emergency and Specialty Hospital, v VES, and others that I don't need, Antec, they own Antec, which is a huge uh, laboratory. Um, 
they they own all these. They have four, eight, uh, almost. They have eleven different companies, not all based. You know, they're worldwide. In fact, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, Mars Pet Care is a growing segment of approximately fifty brands made up of about eighty five thousand associates associates in more than fifty five countries, who serve the nutrition and health needs of dogs, cats, horses, fish, and birds every day. So going back to this paper, this person is part of that vet care and their whole purpose is to make sure, oh gosh, I can't say it this way. They won't like that. Let me put it this way. I was listening to another uh, functional medicine doctor who brought up the idea that we have uh, medicine 3.0 coming aboard. And if you're into geeky things, you know, you have uh, versions of software. It's like 1.0, then 2.0. And 1.0 was basically realizing that washing the hands made, made a big difference. That was basic care, septic systems, pooping out in the outhouse and keeping away from your food. That was medicine 1.0. Medicine 2.0 was diagnosing and treating diseases. And it started with a uh, development of uh, the theories that said basically bacteria kill us. And so if you have a strep infection in your horse, it gets sick, it could possibly die. An E. coli bacteria, uh, a virus such as SARS-CoV-2 can kill us. So it's all about eliminating and sterilizing the environment and uh, squashing it. So I think uh, most of these feed companies are in version medicine 2.0, which basically says, Look, we'll make your your animals sick, and we're going to support the veterinarians who get them better. So it's a con constant, endless process of moving around. I don't care how they dress it up, because nowhere on that vet uh, pet care page do they talk about how they're tr designing anything that makes our 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 animals healthier. They're talking about diversity, inclusion. They're talking about sustainability. These are the hot topic buttons that makes you feel good inside. And I think there's not a person on the planet who doesn't want our planet to become healthier overall. Our air quality, our water quality, our soil bacteria quality, uh, all of this is, I think, in everybody's interest. Uh, most of you who know me know I drive a Tesla, which is, you know, you could argue still uses carbon to be made, but the amount of miles I drive uh, we're well beyond that break-even point where I'm now saving the planet in my carbon footprint. And I know that in another six months or so, I will be generating electricity at my house that will be 100% solar. So I won't even be using any of the electricity that's made by oil or windmills or nuclear or anything. It'll just be made by sun energy. So I'm looking forward to that day. I'll keep you updated on that. So I don't think there's anybody, whether you're conservative or liberal, uh, you know, what color skin or what religion you believe in. I think we all want to live in a healthy environment. And that's great. And I'm proud that Mars is doing that. But what Mars is doing here is saying, look, stop feeding grain. Couldn't I couldn't say anything more positive than that. Uh, but they're saying don't feed grain to insulin dysregulated animals. And I'm suggesting that if you don't feed it to your normal healthy horse, they won't get insulin dysregulation. And that's based on human signs. Second, they're saying if you soak your hay, which I think every veterinarian out there is going to tell you to soak the hay if you've got laminitis, they're saying add in a balancer. And I'll bet you a dollar that they're, um, they make a balancer, a ration balancer. And I look at the ingredients in these ration balancers, and they're all they all have inflammatory ingredients. It's crazy what they put in there. All right. Um, let me move on to number five. And they've got two more, five and six. Number five is feeding for maintenance of body weight and body condition score. So they're basically asking you to use your eyeball and make sure that your horse doesn't lose any body fat too much or doesn't gain too much body fat. And I think that's relatively a good idea. But the problem is most people don't know what a good body condition score is. I mean, if you look at me, I have love handles. I have this extra body fat on me that I have to ask myself, is it healthy or is it not healthy? Do I want to look so lean and fit like I should be on a bodybuilder magazine? Not necessarily. They found that the 
some of these guys who lose their body fat are just as susceptible to diseases. Uh, if you follow bodybuilding, uh, Bill Phillips just about died of COVID and there wasn't, there was like 4% body fat on the man. So there's so many questions to ask and there is evidence that some body fat is protective, but I think it's deeper subject than that. And I will get to that in a second. So um, he's basically saying maintain their weight. So feed to consider depending on clinical situation, includes supplemental vegetable oil and or feeding highly digestible fiber sources. Example, soaked, unmolassed, I've never heard that word, unmolassed, uh, no molasses, sugar beet or soya hulls and or a low starch and sugar commercial fortified. What is sugar commercial fortified complementary feed, which ideally has been shown to produce in target animals a low postprandial, or that's after eating, glucose insulin response? Okay. So he's recommending vegetable oil. And you know my thoughts on vegetable oil. If it ain't a fruit oil, it's not good for you, at least in humans. Uh, the vegetable oils are polyunsaturated and they are highly inflammatory in humans. And seeing that humans and horses are both mammals, I'm going to suggest that it's probably inflammatory for them too. So it says corn and soy oils are typically used. Well, the reason the corn and soy oils are there is because they've taken it out of the corn or the soybean uh, because they want to make a meal. Corn meal and soybean meal are oil extracted feeds. So they have all this oil lying around and they don't want to just pour it out in the ocean. So they give it to us to feed our horses and around, around, around it goes. So um, he cautions that you shouldn't be using um, too much oil and uh, they, to look for uh, fat in the manure or issues with palatability. And I'm like, yeah, how about... Uh, Free fecal water syndrome, where the, the horse develops the squirts. How about that? Anyway, uh, he gives a dose for oil. And I've said a hundred times that if you're going to feed fat to your horse, feed it in a non-inflammatory way. I'm a big fan of Cool Stance, which is shredded coconut meal. You can find them on the internet. Um, I forgot what they're address is, but look up cool stance, C O O L S T A N C E. And that will provide some fiber. A lot of people like beet pulp. That's great. Um, beet pulp is the byproduct of the sugar beet industry where they squeeze the sugar out of the sugar beets. And what's left over is the pulp. And some people believe that this is highly nutritious. It helps feed the gut bacteria in the hind gut. Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. That's fine. If you want to feed beet pulp, I, it's just a, one of these battles that's just never ending and nobody can prove me right or wrong, but it's not natural. Nor is soybean meal natural. It, it just isn't. Nor is keeping a horse behind a fence natural. Nor is feeding horse hay, you know, seven, you know, 365 days a year. That's not natural. There's so many unnatural things we do with our horses that we have to pick and choose and figure out what works for our horse and what doesn't work for our horse. So what he's saying is if your horse loses too much body condition, or it's old and it's already lost a lot of body condition. It's basically a walking skeleton. You need to feed something to add some uh, fat to them. Remember, the best way to add body fat to a horse is to add sugar. Unfortunately, there are some horses and some people that add more sugar to it and they remain very thin, very skinny, and then they die. So I agree, keep the sugar away, add some body fat by adding uh, good non-inflammatory fats. Seeing that horses can't eat steak uh, with all the fatty tissue on there, um, and you don't want to give them the sugar of corn and other things, then Cool Stance shredded coconut is probably your best bet. If you have to, you can get coconut oil, but be careful. You can get diarrhea from that. Um, just work with your vet. Work with your vet and say, look, this horse is skinny. I have worked on several horses that are 32 years old and up that are walking skeletons that can barely move. They're so stiff and they take them off all grain and they add uh, nothing but saute and they add some cool stains and soybean meal. And these horses eventually die uh, several years later 
but they're running around the field like they're two-year-olds, which is kind of cool. And then the last thing that they have here is exercise. Increasing free and or structured exercise based on veterinary advice may help limit muscle loss associated with calorie-restricted diets can have an anti-inflammatory effect. And even at relatively low intensities and duration, such as working trot for 15 minutes. Uh, then in italics, it says consideration should be given to increase the number, length, and intensity of exercise occasions or changing the type of structural activity, riding or lunging, as well as prolonging free activity in the paddock. Track systems help. Conclusion. It is important when managing the insulin dysregulated animal to develop a targeted nutrition and exercise plan for that individual animal and its clinical needs that consider the avail available complementary feeds and forages, as well as facility and time constraints of the owner and the carer, and so on. Monitoring is essential, as is good communication between the veterinarian and the owner caregiver. Did anybody hear me say anywhere that you should be looking at protein? It's how, how convenient is it that these, these feed companies just will not promote protein? So I'm going to wrap up this uh, podcast by saying that I sat down with my wife this morning. We reminisced about our days back in the 70s where my wife worked on a thoroughbred training farm where they took two-year-olds in training. And she always gave them calf manna. Calf manna is a product made up from carnation that used to be a uh, soybean meal, a lot of soybean meal with some vitamins and minerals added in the anise flavor, which is licorice, which horses love. And they constantly fed soy, um, this, this product, calf manna. Calf manna today is a little bit different than it was back in the 70s. They've changed the ingredients to keep the costs down so they can keep selling the stuff. Uh, at my farm in 1973, we had thoroughbreds in training and brood mares. And we had a whole bag of soybean meal. We'd add it to the, to the um, feed. And nobody actually knew how much to give, but we'd put a cup in, you know, and keep these youngsters going. And we had no idea, but we only fed oats and uh, we never fed corn straight. We never fed, uh, we kind of put some bran in, in the winter, uh, oat bran, pardon me, uh, wheat bran. And that's what we fed them. All of a sudden, on the scene came these bags of sweet feed where it had molasses sticking all the ingredients together. And they said, this is the best thing for horses. And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, it didn't make sense. A horse was doing fine on, on oats and soybean meal. And now I come along in, you know, the late 19, like 19, listen to me, 2016, uh, I've been preaching, uh, take your horse off grain and add soybean meal. So, you know, we're coming up on almost a decade of telling people this. This is nothing new. This is a go back to way the way it was working before we had dental disease, uh, fractured teeth. We had suspensory ligaments of affecting every horse out there. Uh, kissing spine. We're now having sleep disorders up the wazoo. Everyone's getting sleep disorder um, and having behavioral issues. And this whole behavioral thing blew up. I mean, how many different trainers can you name right now that talk about difficult horses and how you can learn how to train these horses? And I keep saying, well, step one, take them off all grain, soak the hay, get the sugar out of them, calm them down. I wonder how this would help all the people who are driving out on the interstate system right now. And the road rage and this debate between you know, uh, parties and uh, uh, inability to come to agreement and just talk with each other. It's just... It's all boils down to what kind of inflammation do we have inside ourselves and inside our horses? And I've been saying this forever. I'll say it one more time. Decrease all inflammation inside the horse. That's step number one. Inflammation includes all the inflammatory ingredients that we feed, a barn that's not healthy or happy, no ventilation, a barn caregiver that's abusive, a horse that doesn't like its job, uh, there's tons of different reasons. Doesn't like its neighbor. There's so many mental stresses and environmental stresses. Uh, noise that's coming over a scratchy radio system or music the horse doesn't like or light that's on 24-7 and the horse can't get decent sleep. There's so many things that we could look at that could help our horses relax and be at peace 
And once these horses are relaxed and are at peace, then we can start building them back up to the way their genetic potent potential would, would give it. So in other words, that's when we start adding the, the supplements that they need, which is good quality water. It need um, a mine to salt block, uh, some forage. It has to have access to forage, whether it's a, a variety of plants in the pasture, or if you can't do that, if it's a monograss, uh, fine. Then get some uh, hay and if, if necessary, soak it. Uh, if not necessary, don't soak it. You know, just see how it goes, but watch for their body fat, watch the body conditions, have your vet do some of these blood tests that will test for ACTH, for Cushing's disease, and test for insulin resistance in your horse. Do a challenge test where you take a baseline fasting and then administer some sugar and then see what the blood vessel, what the blood values are afterwards. Uh, these are tests that can help you determine whether your horse is having this insulin dysregulation. And then finally, start adding the ingredients the horse needs. And that's not found in these ration balancers. It just isn't. I don't know why. Uh, it's a gimmick and they're sucking in more and more people because they want to do the best for the horse. And adding a ration balancer may not be that, that thing. What you might have to do is uh, look at their protein intake and realize that they're not getting the high quality protein. They're only getting good quality protein, which means they're not getting all the amino acids that the horse should be getting. And that's found in soybean meal. Now, if you want to feed hemp meal, that's fine. It's legal now. I've got a client who thoroughly believes in hemp meal. It's a little bit more expensive. I've got another client who will only feed uh, pea protein because she believes that peas are good and soybeans are bad. But, you know, we're not, horses aren't humans. And the safety factor of soybean meal is just incredible. So, when you start adding back the high quality protein, limit the carbohydrates that's going in there, making sure the gut microbiome is, is phenomenal, that gut microbiome will help convert the cellulose or what they call the structural carbohydrate and turn that into butyrate. And that is a uh, short chain fatty acid. So the sugar of the structure turns into fat and the horse gets all the energy it needs from the more efficient fuel of fat rather than glucose. So I've gone over this. This is just a summary. If this has boggled your mind, look up some of other, the other uh, podcasts that I've had on this where I go into it in detail. Consider joining the Horses Advocate where I have lots of information. I have a nutrition course where we go over this. Uh, but you don't have to become an uh, advocate. It does help promote uh, worldwide the spread of this information through the high cost of maintaining these podcasts and um the websites. And I would appreciate your support. If you do that, you're helping other horses do that uh, by keeping me uh, behind the microphone talking about it. Uh, there's a couple other things. I'm starting to read another book by Robin Chutnick. I read a book of hers a decade ago called the gut microbiome. And now she has a book out about viruses in the microbiome. And it's fascinating because we already know that if you have a gut microbiome that includes a certain a species of bacteria, then if you come in contact with SARS-CoV-2, uh, that bacteria has actually been shown to eat the virus and these people don't get COVID. And those who get COVID, serious COVID, uh, have a um, microbiome that does not include these species. And if you relate that to horses, you have equine herpes virus, influenza virus. Um, these viruses are hurting and making sick and killing uh, lots of horses. And we're all aware of it. We're all trying to vaccinate for it. But if you got the horse's gut microbiome to be normal, then these viruses wouldn't stand a chance in that environment. They would all just fizzle out. So that's what this book on, by Robin Chutnick is all about. I'm going to try and do a book report on that later. Um, and I'm trying to stay away from carbohydrates, trying to stick with um, Fat for meals, I take exogenous ketones now, which are ketones is a type of fat that your body makes, that your liver makes to supply energy to your cells. And that's what I drink in the morning. And that's an interesting concept too. And I'll let you know what I feel about that in the future as well. Okay, I've uh, bent your ear long enough. Uh, get going, do what you got to do, move on. And I'll try to come back in the next couple of weeks with more and more of these podcasts maybe stacked on top of each other to discuss what they're talking about 
at the American Association of Equine Practitioners Conference as I earned my continuing education credits needed for my licensings. But um, this was one of these articles that continues to disappoint, put out by a huge company, the same maker of, uh, this is good, uh, the Three Musketeers, Altoids, uh, Big Red. I used to chew Big Red all the time, bubble gum, uh, Double Mint Gum, Dove Bars, uh, Eclipse, if you're into that, Hubba Bubba Bubble Gum, Juicy Fruit, Lifesavers, M&Ms, uh, Milky Way, Orbit, Skittles, Snickers, Starburst, Twix, uh, and Wrigley Spearmint Gum, and Extra. So that's the company. That's where they're getting all their money uh, because we keep buying that stuff. And then they talk about the other nutrition. And honestly, you know, I love the idea that they're trying to help the environment and get everything going, but they're ignoring the fact that we need more protein and we don't need as much uh, fruits and that's humans. But in the in the Mars pet care, they have to understand that prevention is better. This is what I'm driving home. If you can prevent a disease from occurring in your horse, then you're going to be you're going to be miles ahead. You're you're you know I have no nothing against veterinarians. I mean I am a, a I am a vet, but I would rather be teaching people how to care for their pets in, in a better way than constantly going out there and fixing the broken down pets. You know just you know. We have to get into what's called medicine 3.0, as um, my um, medicine uh, uh, podcaster talks about. Medicine 3.0 is where we go in and start preventing these things uh, through genetic analysis, uh, looking at our genes, fixing them. Um, I know we're getting there. I know that um, I, I have a client who's got lung cancer right now, but it's a, such a rare lung cancer and a never smoker. And she is now getting treatment to prevent an enzyme that's being produced by a mutation in her genetics. And by treating that mutation, preventing that enzyme from being produced, she's holding this uh, cancer in check, which is just phenomenal. I mean, this is cutting edge. This is what we call medicine 3.0. And I think we start looking at the horse and start doing these preventive measures and start teaching how you can prevent the horse from becoming ill in the first place we're all going to be happier. Anyway, that's Doc T. I uh, hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, if you like it, please subscribe uh, to your podcast feed. Uh, let other people know. Post it on your social media. Let them know about it. Let them understand that there's uh, some voices out here trying to support our horses in a preventive way. And we can fix a lot of these things if we start acting on now. The younger, the better. All right, that's it. Doc T, I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.